Okay, hi guys, how's it going? Sorry I was not here last Thursday night, but I got a little sick and ran a high fever from Wednesday through Friday, and I just wasn't able to get out. I'm sorry. Um, I have started posting videos again. I am still feeling kind of duh, but I'm up and around. So we're going to do the best we can. If I start feeling just too duh, I'll let y'all know and call it quits. But so far, we'll be fine. Hello, Ryan. How you doing? Thank you for dropping in and listening tonight. Well, it's finally cooled off as far as the fall, but we're still having days in the 80s down here. So that's me and Bear went out. Hello, Diane. Me and Bear went out and uh, we're going to do some scouting, but he's going through some um, back work and had to do some physical therapy with him today. So we didn't get to do it. They wanted him to walk around with a pair of canes. It's kind of hard to tote a shotgun whenever you're, walking with two canes ain't it you know maybe you could make a double barrel cane or something we'll work it out hello joe hello herbert oakley oh yeah time to do fall camping absolutely hello mr johnny from statesboro georgia hello good evening terry garen hello bray road hello there cj thank you very much i am feeling somewhat better it's it's a slow process it's one of the things where i run a very high fever for say 48 hours and it just drains you down and it's not covid it's some other ailment and it's like something kind of builds up i have them like every one and a half years one year apart something like that and it'll come on me just like that um in fact on wednesday i had gone to eat lunch and I had sat down with a plate of food to go to eat. And in less than 10 mouthfuls, I went from being completely normal to where I was shaking from, from fever and chills. Um, I managed to get the food into a to-go box. I managed to get into the truck uh, to come home. And I'm sitting there. I look like I'm having a seizure. I'm shaking so bad. I was driving 25 miles an hour with the flashers on. And if somebody met me, I just pull off the side of the road. Um, but I did make it home and then I had a real high fever for about 48 hours. I, it started around lunchtime Wednesday and the next time I can really point to and say it's really clear was about nine or 10 o'clock on Friday night. So the rest of it was kind of a haze where I was running that high fever. So Mopar, hello. Anchor down leather. Thank you very much. Glad to help. Kevin, hello. Oh, uh, Garen, that saw me on Scab's channel last night. Uh, thanks for coming over and listening. Um, we talk about whatever on my channel. It's where you ask your questions. And so you ask questions, I'll be glad to answer them as best as I can. Now, you start talking about astrophysics, like popped up in a few ago. I'll, I'll give you the best answer I can, but it's going to be a, you know, a swag, scientific, wild ass guess, because that's not my field of endeavor. But I will give you an honest opinion on anything that I know. I try to anyway. And Washburn, Billy, hello. Tony, York, hello. Bearded Audrey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. But yeah, it is fall. It is time to be camping. Uh, I had planned to go camping this weekend, but it's just not going to happen. So I'm going to try for next weekend. Uh, this is the weekend that is the Georgia Bushcraft Gathering. And I had thought about going up to it, but life gets in the way, you know. And so it's not going to happen. So next weekend, or hopefully sometime very soon, I'm going to go out and do an overnighter. Uh, sling up my hammock, do that type of stuff. I be, believe it or not, I've been itching to fish. Uh, now that it's cooled off, it feels kind of like spring. And um, I've been noticing the bass and stuff on this. Our bass do not go dormant down here in the south, but they do get a little cold mouth where they're not so interested in striking and stuff like that. But you can still catch them. And uh, so I've been kind of halfway thinking about sneaking off and seeing if I can get a bass or two on a, a rig uh edgar yes sir i did i missed last week's sorry to be that way and then i think 
week or two back before that, I had to skip out because it was my wife's birthday. And so I had to, you know, mama happy, you can be happy. So take care of mama. You know what I mean? Uh, good evening from Columbus. Hello, Joseph. I am. Uh, Diane, no, it won't necessarily do that. It won't necessarily crack the wood. Um, since the two main springs are actually pitched to the front trigger guard, uh, yeah, to the trigger guard, their free movement should kind of, if it's in any way binding, and normally they don't. It's actually the top half of the spring is what does the work. Okay. Uh, the bottom half moves very little when it releases. And so uh, that top half. If it is touching the size of the grip, it will fairly rapidly kind of wear down and smooth out uh, card, so to speak, the inside of the grip frame and make space for itself. Now, if you notice that, especially when it's really, really cold, if the grip, if it slows the hammer down, the grip may actually be under the cold compressing and the wood may be compressing. And you may need to get in there and just sand just a little bit, make a little bit more clearance. But I put doubles on the 49s and... Uh, Wells Fargo's before and didn't have any trouble. I've also done the trick uh, without putting doubles of putting a little wooden block. You've got the screw coming through the mainspring right above it, putting a little bitty wooden spacer thin. And this will kind of tension up the spring a little bit more. Those springs, some of those springs are a little bent too much, if that makes sense. Where the originals was more like that, the modern ones are more like this. And so that gives it less lift. And like we talked of the the load that it's pushing up on the spring is not as much. And if the Orvis in the percussion cone is too big, the back pressure will just blow it back. That um, pocket Navy I had, which, which I have, excuse me, the um, action is basically a 49. It's just a rebated cylinder and a bigger bore to make it into a 36. So it's basically the 49 pocket model. And as you saw in some of my earlier videos, when I was trying it out, I mean, it would blow it back to half cock. 100% cap jam, guaranteed. And so I had to change out the cones on it in order to get it, uh, get those orifices down, get the black pressure down. And that cured my problem. If that had not, then I was going to do like Mark Hubs did and go to double spring or put a little spacer in to add a little bit more up tension and see if that would fix it. Okay, uh, Garen, I have a question I got from him and was wondering about your views on sharpening on it. Uh, Garen, sharpening on what? I'm sorry, I'm not following along there. Clone name Gizbo, hello there from Ireland. Kind of late, but Trapper Dan, hello, sir. Good to see you. Okay, Wolf94, hello, Blackie. Gray man or ordinary tactical outdoor gear during bug out? Would you try to blend or care not about blend? The whole object of the game here is not to attract attention, but if you have to, be so obvious to not seem important. Um, so blend in. Uh, having nice, hot, cool tactical gear, people going to recognize that. People going to realize you got stuff. And so that's one of the things that kind of mm, when I'm, I've read some of the books and stuff about such events and your our hero is walking around with this big hero, da, 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 and the da, 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 I'm going to see that a half mile off. That's going to tell me that's the guy with the gear. And a single individual is never, you know, going to hold up to a crowd. Just bottom line. Um, if you, have to defend yourself that's great but you're not going to hold up to a crowd you're either going to run out of you'll probably run out of ammo before you run out of crowds and so in those kind of uh, world go to poo poo situations um so it's better to blend in uh, in fact whenever i traveled a lot and i was working for a government contractor and we were doing military radars and a lot of stuff like that and i was a, a bonded courier for a while where I was carrying, it wasn't super classified, but it was sensitive stuff, you know, key uh, uh, computer cards and stuff like that. And I'd have to take them to MIT or I'd have to take them to um, uh, Huntsville up there or whatever for what we were doing. And they got one of those fancy, you know, briefcases and all like that. And I went, uh-uh. And they said, well, you know, da-da-da-da situation, you're fine. 
I got it. And I put it in an old rotty looking Alice pack that was barely held together. So I'd be wearing blue jeans, a ratty old t-shirt, a jungle fatigue shirt, my hat, and that old Alice pack. And I'd go walking through an airport. I didn't look like I had two nickels to rub together. It didn't matter that what was in that box was probably worth a couple million bucks. But the fact that it didn't attract any attention, blend. That's the whole thing. You want to blend in with your environment. That's my two cents. Hiram, hello. Ryan, do I go on jobs? I go out on walks, things like that. I tow the pack. Um, I do. I stay very active. I try my best. I have uh, uh, traumatic arthritis over 65% of my body. I just wore out everything. I worked very hard. And if it was dumb and stupid and the girls thought it was cool when I was a young man, I had to do it. And I broke a lot of bones, dislocated a lot of stuff. And so I'm one of them that has to keep going. If I stop, I'll lock up. And uh, in fact, I've got to re break in my right knee. I have not been doing deep knee bends or squats in a while. And my right knee has got to where it just goes to point X and it just stops. It's just like you just wedged a block in there. And it's keeping me from getting down on my knees easily. And so I have to get back out there and start flexing and working that again and get it limbered back up. Uh, as long as I stay active and keep everything moving, I'll be cool. But if not, you know, it won't take but a couple of months and it'll be where, you know, I was using a cane when I was in my early 30s. And I determined through talking to, to people that would really had a, a knowledge that it was just far better to just push through the pain and make it work as long as I wasn't just destroying anything in my joints. Just make it work. And it did. I got people that would work with me therapist and stuff let's break it loose let's get it going and i got limbered back up where i could move around again and so i'm one of them that i can't stop i'm gonna have to keep toting a pack keep moving keep paddling keep something you know i go for about a mile or two walk every couple of days at a pretty brisk pace and then i've got a flight of stairs over here at a, a church that's coming out of their parking lot going up to the upper parking lot it's about 25 steps and i go up and down that at high speed forwards and backwards Keep everything limped up. Then, of course, a couple push-ups, whatever. It's just if this is starting to get stiff or something, okay, let's start working with it. But that. That's my exercise program. I'm old and I'm lazy. Do the best I can. Terry, smallmouth. I have only got to fish for smallmouth twice. Uh, largemouth is what we got down here. It is not common to have smallmouth down here. It's largemouth bass. And um, what some people call... Uh, Calico bass, we call crappy. Uh, brim, which are sunfish to some parts of the country, are very prevalent. Of course, catfish and stuff. Terry, thank you very much. I'll tell her. Hello, Stephen. There you are. Goat Farm. Hello, Stephen. Hey, uh, Stephen, how you doing? Glad to see you. Uh, remember what we talked about last night? Get up with me. I talked to Bear today. He wants to us to kind of coordinate a little bit. Baloo, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Hello from uh, to Kansas to Randy. Garrett, it's a large night. Oh, okay, got you. About sharpening. Uh huh. Do you trust another who goes against their word in a transaction? Not usually, but you know, that's just me. You tell me you're going to do something. I believe you do it. Do you prove to me you're not? So, okay, uh, Clifford, I got a question. Do you know a few things can disperse a crowd? If it's okay, if I do, dispersing a crowd, um, depending on what they're there for. If the crowd is there to look at the place burning behind you, um, that's going to be kind of difficult because the it's human nature to be attracted to events, things that are happening, etc. Loud events, you know, something big and bad. Uh, somebody about to be in a fight, you can see it in any playground. Two kids get to go, everybody runs to see what's going to go on. That's part of human nature. Um, making people go away is very difficult. It's far easier, if possible, for you to just egress yourself right out of it and get out of it instead of trying to move people out. And law enforcement will tell you that. 
you'll have a wreck or whatever and everybody wants to congregate. So it's far easier for you to pull yourself out of the situation and move on than it is for you to try to get a crowd to, to move on out of the way. Let's see. Hello, Jeff in Texas. What uh, Hurricane Lane, what Sunto compass would you recommend? To be honest, I have not used one in quite a while. I have several, I have a box of compasses. I have quite a few that I've used. I use a, uh, I think it's a Sunto Ranger, is my everyday type carrying in the haversack for navigation. But I'm not trying to do actual serious navigation. And there have been a lot of big improvements in the last 10 years. And so a lot of those Suntos, like those MC2s and stuff, are very good. But I can't, cannot honestly give you an opinion on it because I haven't used one for that type of work in quite a while. My knowledge is kind of dated. I'm sorry. But uh, if I may suggest, one of the things that I learned from an old uh, Marine was to nail a compass. And what that means in English is you have the compass and the needle is simply a piece of metal that's been magnetized, either been magnetized by a coil or it has a magnetic paint applied to it. There can be variation. OK, so what I was taught to do was to take the compass and put it out here in my hand, make sure I got no metal. And then have in my hand like a 16 penny nail or some good piece of metal. OK, fair steel. Holding the compass flat, looking at it, come from the side. So north is pointing directly away from me. Come from the side like at the east and do like this and see how close you've got to get before that needle reacts. Ideally, you want a very sensitive needle that the, I'm this far out when that needle starts. I'm doing this and that needle tip starts to rock a little. It means it's detecting that magnetic field. On the other hand, if I get all the way up my touch the size of that thing and then it starts to turn, it's not going to be very sensitive. And how that's affecting us in land navigation is I set a righteous course of 200, let's say. It, it's dead on. And I'm walking my compass. And what's actually happening is I'm slowly drifting. But the compass is not sensitive enough to react to the change. See? So I'm actually, I actually start drifting off at like 201, 202. And by the time I get over here at like 203, and I've done gone like two, 300 yards, then it suddenly shows me, oh, you're at 201. Well, I drift back. But because of that, it's not sensitive enough. Where if I nail it, taking the nail is what I was taught by my uncle, and seeing how close. I, I, ideally, if I've got a place that's got the compasses where I can pick them up individually, even if they're in a the plastic wrap, but you can see the compass needle. I'll get over here to the side away from all the metal and the shelves and everything and see how sensitive. And if you just try that with the ones like even the cheap ones you pick up at Walmart or something, you'd be amazed how some of them are a lot more sensitive. And I had a, uh, a military Kaminga that you had to almost touch a bayonet to it to get the needle to turn. And it was an issue one that was virtually new. Something didn't get done right, okay? And so you're trying to do precision navigation, and it just isn't sensitive enough to tell you're drifting. Whereas I had a uh, Suntu uh, back in the 80s that was one of the clear base plate, uh, base plate compasses, and I could take a 16 pity nail, and I could be six inches out and do like that and make that needle wiggle. You know, and so that was my favorite orienteering and land nav compass because it was very sensitive to variation. If I'm trying to follow just that dead on line to get from A to B and we were doing little competitions and things. So I needed to be able to go quickly from A to B. That's whenever that that one came out because that one was dead on. And I it would if I started drifting, it would just instantly start drifting. It was very sensitive. And so you want a sensitive compass more than you want a high dollar compass. I've seen high dollar compasses that weren't that sensitive. So whatever one you get, test it and see how sensitive it is. That's my little two cents for Okay, crazy Liz. I'll see you 
uh, Sunday at the gun show. Okay. We got a gun show on the 13th. I didn't know we had a gun show next weekend. Huh. Okay. Well, it's news to me. Shows you how far I've been out of the system. I, uh, Washburn, I, uh, Washburn, Billy, I understand. You just got to deal with the situation. You've got to uh, always give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And even if they let you down, okay. Just tells me I can't trust you. Don't mean I don't say hi to you at the water cooler every morning or whatever, but doesn't mean I, I'm ever going to trust you. That's the thing. Okay, let's see. Bray Road, exactly one of those uh, neodymium magnets can make a emergency compass real quick. You know, I teach a, a, a class called Navigation with Nothing. And um, it's one of those things that it needs to be hands-on. I've talked about it a couple times in videos, but I was taught it by my uncle. Uh, who used the base of a K-bar, which is flat and circular, and used it as a clock and a compass for course navigation, okay? And um, I won't go in depth, but I'll give you just a quick idea of it. And a lot of the young ones today can't do this, but it, around anything, okay? I could take a leaf, I could saw off a piece of a log, but just make a round shape, anything, and put one mark on it, okay, up here at the top. Now, if I say that's a clock, and this mark up here at the top is 12 o'clock, well, then that's going to be 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, correct? So it would be, you know, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And that's that's a clock face. I only put one mark on it, but I tell you that's twelve. You should be able to mentally just fill in. So if I say where's three o'clock? Well you know it'd be right there. Well it's four four thirty. It's somewhere down in here. Eh, vaguely, right? So I get out there and all I need to know is the local time for sunset roughly. So if in this place that I'm at, let's say it's 6 p.m., well then holding my arm at uh, arm's length, I can use my fingers to go, okay, at bottom of it, that's 6 in the morning. So four fingers, 15 minutes each. So that'd be 6.15, 6.30, 6.45, 7 o'clock. So that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you count up to the sun and go, okay, it's 10 o'clock. As long as I know the time, it's 10 o'clock. Okay. Now that mark is a clock. Okay. They taught you in navigation to take the hour hand and point it at the sun and half the distance between the hour hand and 12 o'clock is due south. So I would say that's 10 o'clock. I would point it at dead at the sun Here's 12 o'clock, so half the distance that way, that way, would be due south. And once I know any cardinal point, that's south. Well, now that same thing with that mark, it's not a clock. Now it's a compass. That's north, okay? So if I'm holding it and I turn it and I say, okay, that's south. Turn the compass around. Tick mark. That's due south. Which way I need to go? East. East is that way, and I just turn and go. And so I could quickly find easterly direction. The other component for doing this at speed, and it's a lot faster than putting the sticks in the ground and trying to figure out is once I do it, light changes every, every seven minutes because as we rotate on the planet, the light is changing and your angle is changing a little bit. So we know that the sun is always in some southerly direction in the northern hemisphere. So if you are looking and can physically see the sun, even if it's over here and I'm looking that way, but it's like right there, it must be south of me to some degree because it's below the equator. Okay. 
So any shadow is automatically pointing in a northerly direction. At sunup, it's pointing northwest. And at sundown, it's pointing northeast. At 12 o'clock, it's pointing due north. So any shadow is a stick line. Okay? So knowing that, knowing that this is a clock and that, okay, that direction south. And I turn to face the direction I want to go and I look at the ground and see where my shadow is. Say my shadow is pointing off at like 11 o'clock to my body. If straight off my nose is 12 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock. Keep your shadow there for the next 20 minutes and walk as fast as you want to go because the sun, you're now the shadow stick, see? And that keeps, I'll, I'll wiggle a little bit in my orientation, but if all I need is a dead reckoning direction, I can just about run at a dead run. And in 20, 30 minutes, stop and redo this trick again. Uh, okay, that's east, da 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 time now is, da 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 that way south, da 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 I need to go this way, da-da-da. And you go on. And uh, you can very quickly, without any compass, do dead reckoning navigation where all I need is a direction to get me out of something. Because the other half of this is your homework before you go out to camp. And there is no such thing as a Star Trek teleporter. And so how I got here was I came out here. And what that means is I came out here to camp, hike, canoe, whatever. Okay. And so whenever I decide I'm going to this forest, let's say, bring out your phone and bring up the map. Ideally, Google map or something and go look and say, okay, that's where I'm going. Pull back. Okay. It's going to face north. Make sure you're facing north. What's due south of me? Well, there's a river going across kind of diagonally due south. Okay, what's to the east? That's the road I came in on. Does it run the full length of the property I'm going to be on? Yes. Okay, I came in that way. What's to the north of it? Agricultural fields. What's over here on the west side? Well, there's a housing complex. I can't get lost in those woods because I know what's in that direction. You know, it's like I'm in a box now. If I know what's on each one of the walls of the box, if I get in there and get completely turned around, which direction I want to walk to go home? East, because that's the road I came in on. If I walk till I hit the road, I can figure out, oh, the car is this way, the car is that way. And so all I need to know is east. So that'd be, 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 east, and just start walking in that direction. The shadow keeps me from going in a circle, and I'll walk straight out. I was taught it by old Marines and timber cruisers who were counting the... Uh, board feet of timber and planted pines and they didn't use a compass they just figured out right quick and they couldn't get lost in woods because they looked at an aerial map and knew that this 400 acres 500 acres a thousand acres um what's on the borders and they knew what it was so if they ever got turned around they just walked to the side and knew exactly where they were and they went back to the truck you know simple little things like that it's the hard stuff to teach unless I'm standing there with you and we've got something to make a compass out of and actual time. And then you, when the light goes on, you go, oh, you're kidding me. It's that easy. Yeah. You, you can find ways to get out that easy. Okay. Bella, is it possible to cold blue zinc? Not that I'm aware of. Um, zinc is usually plated. And usually bluing is actually a chemical process that's reacting with ferrous metal, iron, etc. That's the reason you can't blue aluminum. However, there's a product that's aluminum black that will turn aluminum to a black color. It acts like bluing, but it's for aluminum. That may work for zinc, but gun bluing would not work for uh, zinc. Wrong kind of metals there. It, what it reacts to is the iron in it, and there isn't any iron in zinc. So, wouldn't work. Happy birthday, Danny. Good evening, James Singer. 
Wolfchuck, do you think that a canteen kit may be enough for bugging out a minimalist cooking kit? And what about hatchet versus folding saw for bugging out? For one person, uh, for me personally, or for somebody that's got a little experience with it, a canteen cook set is usually sufficient. I mean, you can take care of yourself until you get into a much better situation. And beyond that, if you got a bigger hunk of meat or whatever, just put it on a stick, put it over the fire, and start cooking that way. You, know, you don't have to have utensils to cook for a lot of stuff. As far as, you know, pots and pans, if it's just hunks of meat or whatever. Even fish and stuff can be just put on to an improvised skewer and put over the fire and cooked. So there's other ways. But a canteen cook set will handle a bunch of it. And that's what I usually care for just me. Nine times out of ten, but I got a lot of experience with it. And what about a hatchet versus folding saw for bugging out? Folding saw um, makes a lot less noise disadvantage saws are great until they finally get dull you can easily sharpen a hatchet versus a saw so in the long term you're going to need to learn how to sharpen saw and that is a skill uh, a lot of people don't realize that in the united states we didn't start manufacturing saws saws did not become common in the united states up until about the late 1800s mid to late 1800s because we were still importing them from Europe. It was a very specialized steel and a very specialized skill to make it. And no blacksmith could make a saw. Oh, they can make something with teeth on it, but it's not a saw. It doesn't cut. So those big elaborate saws and crosscut saws, and most of them came out of Germany and things like that. And it was only about, I think it was like 1855 or something like that. They finally created a factory in the United States to make saw blades. And so go to stinky time in the world no blacksmith can make a, a saw of any quality it's a specialized skill and specialized steel to make saw blade it's a spring steel but to get it that hard and make the tips functional other than just making something shaped like it so a saw is absolutely better for it's more quiet and etc but in the deep long term you're going to need to stockpile some of them blades. And um, an axe is going to outdo it in the extreme long term because you can sharpen that a lot longer than you can a saw. One of them little things nobody thinks about because they're so common today. What do I think about zinc for rifle bullets? The density is supposed to matter less. Yes, but, okay. One of the reasons you don't ever mix lead and zinc is it produces too hard a bullet zinc when you put it under pressure cracks where lead does not lead when you put it under pressure it acts like chocolate it smears and that's the reason we use it in our rifle barrel for, for shooting etc a zinc bullet um would kind of equivalent lead the bore because it's not going to flex it's it's too rigid it's written there's very few things we can actually use. Now, cars, copper jacket is, etc. You think, well, that's harder. Copper also bends and flexes under pressure, where zinc doesn't. It just cracks, you know. So it's not a good choice. It can be used as a core inside of a copper jacket. Yeah. Inside of a lead core, if you could somehow do it like that, you could probably get away with that. But it's not a good thing to make bullets out of. Gary, what's the best first gun? Okay, if you're wanting a gun uh, for hunting and outdoor woodscraft stuff like that, I recommend a single shot shotgun for a lot of reasons. One, very few parts to break. Two, they're usually extremely robust. They last for hundreds of years. You can still find single shots are made in the 1800s. They're still in everyday use for some poor person. That's just all they can afford. It's still working. You know, and so a single shot works very, very well. And you can hunt small game with it. You can hunt big game with it. Now, once you become versed with it and very in-depth with it, then you may want to proceed to something else. I recommend starting out with like a 22 to learn the control, and etc. If you're in a city and that's not very viable or easy, it's hard to find places to shoot, air gun. Start out with air guns and learn the skill. It's same application across the board. Once you learn how to properly shoot, control, be accurate, then move up to the guns. All a gun is is a tool. Like what kind of hammer or what kind of saw or what kind of axe. 
and learn what is kind of best suited to what I'm going to be looking for. Don't be toting an elephant gun when you're going after bunny rabbits because ears and tails don't make much of a meal. So learn what it is. And with a shotgun, you can, by what load you put into it, what shells you put into it, you can hunt anything from the smallest little quail all the way up to moose. It just depends on what you load it with. So it gives you the maximum uh, choices and, and capability. All right. Let's see. Yeah, uh, Wharton, about a, a tip, uh, a quick tip is to make a quick sink in the ground, take a garbage bag, you dig two shallow holes and line them with the plastic and then put water into it. And you can wash dishes, et cetera, things like or wash you. Uh, that was a, a mainstay of the Boy Scouts for many, many years. Before it was plastic garbage bags, we used to carry a piece of canvas, a good tight weave canvas that was a strip about, oh, like, 36, 40 inches wide and maybe six, seven, eight feet long and just dig a couple of shallow holes and roll it out and press it down in the holes and then pour the water into it. And you once you had water in it, you know, like a couple inches of water, I could take boiling hot water and add to that water and make a hot water, you know, just by adding a little cool, little hot, make hot dish soap water to be able to wash greasy pots and pans and stuff like that. And then when you got done, you just picked up one end and picked up. And the water ran out, and you just hung it up on a tree, let it dry, rolled it up, and you're way to go. Yeah, we've used that quite a bit of times. Bello, how do you manage to give a nice patina to the brass frame of a dragoon? Okay. Take a plastic container, a storage tub will work. Inside of it, put a small dish like a saucer and put white vinegar, plain old like you use in the kitchen, white vinegar into it, and then put table salt into it. Now put the barrel, or excuse me, the brass, hanging by a piece of wire or standing up so it's like laying on the floor, inside that box with it, not over it, but with it, and then put the lid on and give it a couple hours. It's the fumes coming off of the reaction between the salt and the vinegar that will cause the brass to tarnish very quickly and it'll add a patina to it very quickly. In my um, antiquing video, I showed how doing that and it worked very well. Okay. Um, Bush Pony, will your BB method work on a Trangia kettle with the little black stuff at the bottom? Yes. Just put BBs into it, warm water, and just sit there and swirl it around. And that will get any of that stuff out of the bottom or anything that's going to come off. You know, when you, what it is, he's got a container, a Kelly-like kettle that's got some corrosion down in the bottom. He's trying to figure out a way to get it out of the bottom. BBs. Uh, just take steel BBs. Put hot tap water in there, put it in there, and just sit there and swirl it, spin it, and let it kind of scour it out. Rinse it out, look in there. You might have to do it two or three times till you get it out. But that's how I clean out Boy Scout canteens, things like that. It's a way to do it where you don't, you don't have anything that you can get down really in there with. But there's obviously something there. And then uh, a little bit of hot tap water and plain old table salt. Very little can live in salt water. And let that sit, pour that out, rinse that out. And then I put like a, oh, a couple of drops, four or five drops of clear, no perfume, no dye, bleach in, fill it full of water, shake it up really good and let that sit for about 15, 20 minutes. That should sterilize the inside of the canteen where you can just put tap water in it and use it. If when you, you pull the cap off with the Clorox in it and smell it, it should smell like pool water, like swimming pool water. That's what it should have, that smell. And uh, that should take clean. That's how I clean out mine to make them back to usable.
Wharton, the 41022 combo rifle is a great combo. Yeah, it really is. Um, my wife had the Savage, I believe it was 64, that was the 20 gauge 22 combo. And uh, they made those guns for 50 years. They quit making them. And uh, Rossi, for several years, made a, it looks like a single barrel shotgun. But they have interchangeable barrels. And it came as a kit. So you had a 22 long rifle barrel. And you could tip it off and put on the 410 shotgun barrel. And they also made a 20 gauge shotgun barrel and a 243 rifle barrel that locked onto it. And it was designed to be like a first gun for you starting out because they could start out with 22s and 410. And then they could progress up to a 20 gauge and up to a 243 for deer hunting. And I've seen the kit at back. This has been probably 10 years ago, guys. But they were like $300, $350 range in the, what they were going for new. And they you could get them with all four barrels in one kit. And it was just a zipper pouch that had slots for the barrels and the butt stock. A great thing to put behind the seat for a bush plane or a, uh, something to keep at the cabin, for etc. Because it was either deer hunting, squirrels, rabbits, whatever. So, Warden, uh, 410 slug. Yes, it will. Uh, my uncle had some um, state record deer in Florida and he had a double barrel 410 shotgun and that's what he hunted with. And uh, he, people say 410 won't do it. Put a coffee can at 50 yards and how much money do you want to lose? He had hit that coffee can a lot with that gun, but he had took time and practicing hand loaded for it. And so it, it as effective as anything else, Gary, glad to help. Hello, John. Hi, Black. I've been wondering about your thoughts about carrying a wooden wedge in the field. I saw a plastic pair of wedges that is only a one pound could make splitting logs easier than finding rocks. Very true. Um, if you're in a position or you're going to be doing something, especially if you're up north and uh, you're in the cold country and whenever you're thinking about camping uh, all night you're gonna need a fire i don't mean some little bitty you know small thing you need fire or wood um then absolutely a way to to split logs and get to the center core um would be a way to go and plastic those hard polycarb wedges can take a lot of pounding and so once you get the crack started and i've seen it with just taking a saw and going across and starting the crack and then put the wedge in and take a fro and start beating it down. And you'll just split logs or it'll bust off in pieces. But it, it should run. Sometimes the, the grain is right, it'll run. And you can split them off. And also, if you're going to try to make board lumber or whatever. Um, and those modern ones are, are pretty light. I know that Canterbury, for a while, they had that aluminum one. That he was, that, that hardened aircraft aluminum one. That was doing really good. I haven't seen one in a while. But I like the fact it had a place that you could screw a stick into it to hold it. So it, you could hold it in position for a splitting wedge. And that would be a pretty good idea. I'd like to see a, a real good plastic one out of that. It's something that would be cheap enough to be disposable should it have to be sacrificed, you know. Hello, Captain Belgium. How you doing? Thank you very much. Hello, William. Thank you very much. Danny Foster, what is your take on flintlock rifles? Love them. I have a 50 caliber um, Tennessee poor boy full length Kentucky type rifle in flintlock. Um, I shot flintlocks for many years. I still have it and I plan to hunt with it, at least one hunt this year. Um, when you study the history of firearms, over 600 years of history, it was flintlocks. In fact, we're still building flintlocks today. Uh, even though they're replicas and they're designed to use in reenactments or target shooting, we're still building flintlocks today. That's, that's kind of amazing when you think about it, that something from the 1400s, the, 30, the late 13 to early 1400s, you know, it, yes, it's modern, but you could take this and hand it to someone from the 1300s and he would know how to operate it, you know. 
you couldn't say that if you took your grandfather and handed him your phone. They couldn't figure out how to operate that. It'd take days to figure out how that thing even turns on. You know, but you could take this modern made flintlock and hand it back to somebody and they'd know exactly how to make it work. So that's how long that ignition system has been around. And kind of controversial, we were talking about um, world go to poop. What would be the firearm? And I said, a flintlock. And they kind of laughed and said, no, no, seriously. I said, a flintlock. Flintlock uses a rock, a hunk of flint or chert to initiate. A blacksmith can make the liner for the frizzing. And besides that, it's gunpowder. So all you need is gunpowder, wadding of some kind, and, you know, make your own flints. You can't do that with anything modern because you can't make the modern components. You can't make a primer. You can't make, you know, a percussion cap. That's a primer. But a flintlock, you can make all the stuff to make it work in a true world go to poo-poo. So what would they have if everything right now just went... You know, EMP, what firearms be around 100 years from now? Flintlocks. That would be about the only thing that could survive that could be mass produced again. Sarah Hill, I live in Florida and have a 22 Magnum and 20 gauge over and under, do everything with it. Very true. The 22 Magnum is greatly underappreciated for what that, that can do. It is very, very uh, capable, especially with somebody that knows what they're doing and takes time to be very accurate. And uh, it can do a lot more than you think it should. Edgar uh, can hit a coffee can with a pistol, and many people are that way. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine that he is a great pistol shot and he likes to take white tails out to 150 plus yards. He loves the challenge of a handgun and he's very, very good with it. Having said that, if you take him to a dove field with a shotgun, you'll starve to death. He can't hit crap if it's flying in the air, but he's an expert with a handgun. So, you know, everybody's got their abilities, you know. And don't dismiss it. Just because it's difficult to you don't mean somebody else ain't really good at it. Tim Lacey, I'm still looking for a tree band barlow. Not found one yet. Thanks for sharing your time and knowledge. Hey, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Um, Wharton, you can hunt, um, I believe. Okay. Of course, you got to go by state. Everybody, it, state law is going to be different. Um, I know that 12 gauge is legal for just about everything in North America. I know that 20 gauge, I believe is. Now, I have never seen it in writing on moose or something like that, but the weight of a 20 gauge slug and the weight of a 12 gauge slug is not very different. It's just, you know, tenths of an ounce. And velocity is the same. So, yeah, it's a little bigger diameter, but, you know, 410, I don't know. Um, you just got to go by the different gun laws. Here in Alabama, for example, it's 40 caliber or larger handgun can be used for deer. And that includes muzzle loaders, 40 caliber or larger. Um, shotguns, it says 410 or larger, no bigger than 10 gauge. You can't have granddaddy's old eight and come out. That's illegal. So you got to kind of stay in it. You know, if we'll get difficult. Would it work? Absolutely. But uh, never uh, disrespect the man that shoots one gun and shoots it well, what he can do with it. So I've known guys that had 410s that fed the family very capably. On everything from birds to hog to deer to whatever, turkey, name it. And very capably, um, consistently took game at reasonable ranges with, that, with those guns. Uh, 
John, Jonathan Anderson, uh, I do not uh, the, the, have an opinion about the Buck 105 Pathfinders uh, uh, Trail now. I have not used it as that. You know, I cannot comment to that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure of the design. I think I know what the one you're talking about. But uh, Buck, in the past, has made a very good knife. Um, I have seen some models that are obviously they're going to go for the budget, and I've seen some that are still very high quality. Does it fit you? Do you like it? Is it in your budget? That's all that matters. Um, find what works for you. You'll be amazed that when you start looking at people who, like, I've gone around to events and things like that. I've got to meet a lot of people with a lot of big names that you'd recognize. And the knives they're carrying a lot of times are big knives, or etc. But a lot of them ain't necessarily doing that. A lot of them were toting condor pterosaurs or, you know, whatever. It's what fits and works with you. And if you're happy with it, go with it. You know, um, an expensive, fancy knife will not automatically make you a better knife person. It doesn't impart skill based upon its price. On the other hand of that, you know, someone who does have skill and ability can take a much lesser knife due to their skills and make it work a lot better. If you took like a Morris Kachansky and gave him one of them dollar store stainless steel kitchen knives, you know the ones I'm talking about with the metal handle, they're garbage. But with his skill level, and his understanding of the weaknesses of this knife, he will work to its strengths and stay away from its weaknesses. You know, and that's the advantage of it. If you like the knife, you want to do it, try it. Um, I've had a lot of people say, what would be the one ultimate knife? For me, it would be this. But for you, it may be something completely different. It's like, and like I was telling Scott last night on um, Choir Boys Cutlery Outdoors, I said, beer if everybody was the same they'd be one kind of beer but there ain't there's a whole lot of different kinds of beer same way with knives if one knife fit the job for everyone we'd have one knife that did that job we don't there are thousands and so it's like the beer it's what your taste and ability are get out there try it out see if you like it Colin, could modern powder be used in flintlocks? Sadly, no. Um, the ignition point of smokeless powder is much higher than black powder and the substitutes. And all the substitutes are, are actually a smokeless powder that they chemically created so that it does a smoke. Because I remember when they first brought out power decks, it didn't make smoke. That was in the 70s. And people complain, you know, I want it to look like an original, not pop. Um, but at the same time, it has a higher threshold. And so if you try to use a, let's say, modern substitute like Pyrodex or 777 or whatever in a flintlock, you get it erratic ignition. Sometimes it'll go, sometimes it won't. And for the flint to strike it and scratch it and get it to ignite, mm -mm. Black powder is a class A explosive. Smokeless powder is a class C flammable. Different, they're completely different engineered. So when we try to use one and the other, it may, it may not. It may go three times and then not go for the next 25. It really, it gets to be a, a real hit and miss. Uh, Danny, if you learn how to make your own powder, you'll never run out of ammunition. As long as you got the components, you can make it. Knowledge is never wasted. Okay, Peter. Uh, how do you determine if you have good steel or poor steel in knives and axes besides those made in, in the China label? Okay, axes. The job of the axe is to chop, hold an edge, and blunt raw impact, right? I do not want a really soft head. So if I take a file and I go to sharpen it and it seems to be just cutting it like butter, that axe is way too soft. And there are some axes that are coming out of Europe that are kind of highly regarded 
uh, price wise, definitely. But the axe is a little softer. It's because the woods of Europe are softer than the American ones. And so in America, we had really hard axe heads. In fact, there was a uh, companies back in the, the turn that had like what they call flint edged, and they were so hard the average file would just skid across. The average file wouldn't even mark it, and you had to have special sharpening ways to sharpen those uh, because it was so hard and tough. So too soft. Now you know that when you go to sharpen it, if it dulls very quickly and it sharpens really quickly, it's probably too soft to steal. On a knife, that can be an advantage and a disadvantage. A knife that is a very hard edge holds an edge well, but hard can be brittle, which means if I ever do bear down and twist in something, it may snap, break, chip out. Okay? So hard is like glass. And glass is always harder than steel. A piece of broken Window glass is much harder than any pocket knife or any belt knife you're going to get. You can sharpen a knife on glass because the glass is so much harder. But you see how fragile it is. If it ever gets bent, bang. And that's what it is. So for me, um, if I'm not sure of the manufacturer uh, or etc. Uh, before I got and started carrying my William Collins knives, I was carrying a Condor Woods Lower which is a, like a 1095 steel. That's a tool steel. It rusts, yes, but I know that's a good steel. That steel is being used as a tool, you know, a lot. It's made into everything, uh, lawnmower blades and everything else. It's very usable in the field. It sharpens easy, but it does not dull in a hurry, but it flexes rather than breaks out. And I would much rather a bush knife that, if I did eh, and put a little bit too much torque in it for whatever reason, I would very much rather it didn't, I'd rather the blade bent than it break and chip out because I can't fix that chip. I can straighten it out if I accidentally bent it a little bit, but I cannot fix a chip out there other than taking a file and hogging off a huge amount. And so to be answering, you know, what is the better way to check the steel? If I can find out, great. Um, how soft is it? How easy does it sharpen? If I start sharpening, man, it's just carving it off real quick. It's probably going to dull fast as well. Sharpen fast, dull fast. Um, but for a working knife that, like I used to say, I, I carried a K-bar knife. I carried a buck knife. And the buck knives were really, really hard back in those days. They used to do a demonstration where they'd take the knife and, and, baton it through a 16 penny nail and cut the nail in half and it would still shave your arm yeah it was that hard that good dead steel the problem with it was once it ever got dull um the soft arkansas stones we had of those days just wouldn't cut it and so you would take hours trying to get an edge back on that knife and i saw a ton of them that would be bought for christmas Everybody was bragging how sharp their knife was. Man, see his shave hair and all like that. And then by March or May, about the time we started going fishing, everybody's wanting to trade off this knife because it's dull as butter. You know, give me give, give me five dollars and you can have the knife. You know, and I'd pick these knives up and I had the, the gear to sharpen it with, and I'd re-edge those knives and it's because it was too hard. Whereas my K bar was not nearly as hard. It held an edge well, had a good heat treat. But to resharpen, it only took, you know, five, ten minutes. I'd have it back sharp. So it edged easy, but it didn't dull easy. I, I know it's a complicated answer. I'm sorry I'm going on about it. But it's one of those things that's kind of like a feel. Um, once you pick one up and once you start cutting with it, you'll know pretty quick how fast it dulls. Is there any way I can look at it in package and tell you? Let's see. Danny, a 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun can hunt anything on this continent. Very true. The only thing you're limited by is range. Other than that, it'll take care of it. That's one of the reasons that the, the vast majority of our ancestors chose what we call shotguns. Because you could shoot small game, you could shoot big game, you could defend the house, you could whatever. Whereas a rifle was kind of limited in its 
its scope. And at the time of uh, George Washington's army, at the height of it, I re remember reading a report that he had something like 450 riflemen out of however many thousand soldiers. It was like today we talk about a true sniper rifle. How many people have ever heard of one? Oh, yeah. How many people have ever seen one on TV or something? Oh, yeah. How many people have actually held one or owned one? That number goes down real quick. Um, the vast majority of people back in them days had smoothbores, what we call uh, fusees or toolies or things like that, because it was just so much more usable uh, on the frontier to feed the family than a rifle was, because you can't take a 50 caliber rifle and shoot chipmunks. Or shoot the pigeons out of the top of the barn, you know, and not blow holes in the roof. Put a super light load and a little bit of shot in a smooth bore, and you could. And so that was that was one of the advantages of it. And let's see. Productions by Ellie. Have I done a video about sharpening? I have in the past. And, um, and uh, Tiny Titan, yeah. Um, i tell you what I'm going to do. Since I've started doing the Silver Wolf and talking to the uh, old Silver Wolves and stuff that are my subscribers and followers, and these are the people that's got a few years on us, etc., I'm going to redo my playlists. Um, I, it's probably going to be January before I get it really done, but I'm going to redo my playlists. And I'm going to do a, in my playlist, I'm going to put knife sharpening. And then I'm going to put like axe sharpening and kukri big knife sharpening. And then I'm going to do uh, knots. Tying knots, common knots, things like that. And I'm going to break it down to skill sets. So it'll be a little easier to follow along. I've got, what, 1,100 videos now? Go back in those that are too old, too low of quality. I'll just do a modern retake on it, retell the story with better, now that I know a lot more, and redo it and post it into that part of it. Uh, a lot of people ask me about sharpening a knife. It is not voodoo. Um, but it is a skill, and there is a touch to it. And uh, it's, it, once you learn and hearing it of the sound of the blade going across the stone, it changes as it sharpens, and you can kind of dial into that and how it feels, how much resistance it has as it goes across. You figure out pretty quick how it's sharpening and how it's beveling in and how to tell if you're on the right bevel and etc. And so I'm going to be revisiting this. I will be doing a, like I said, a playlist on how to sharpen. Uh, that, that's going to be one of my tough ones. That really is because that's a hand-on skill. And I'm not there with you um, to say, okay, a little bit more pressure or a little different angle. But I can do my best to kind of give you as many pointers as I can to do it. And something that shocked several people, I pointed this out on the, the, the live last night that we've got together and they've been looking at my knife or whatever and they felt of it and they were not, they were expecting a razor and it was not. It was a good, robust working edge that does not dull easy and I can hog off, you know, gnarly oak and stuff like that if I'm trying to make a feather stick or whatever and it doesn't dull quick or whatever, but they would, because it's me and I do know how to sharpen a knife, they expected it to be just a razor and very sharp razor edge blades are very nice but that super thin little edge is easily damaged. It's easily rolled. You ain't got a lot of meat left there to hold it where I've got more of a robust edge, that true little polished razor edge. And a polished edge, you get it right, you cut yourself, you don't even feel it. I mean, when you touch it, you don't feel the resistance. It's like you bumped it and suddenly you look down, you got blood running. You know, it's such a clean cut. But it's so fragile. If you're actually sitting there trying to do something with it, it's going to screw up because it's not very tough. It's very sharp, but it's not very tough. And so most of the time I put my knives in a more robust edge. I want them tough. 
so I can go and go and go without it dulling on me. And uh, me and William Collins fully agree on that. And we have sat down whittling and talking and working with it and et cetera. And we, we fully agree on that, that the, the tough edge, the one that's going to give me the most use before I have to retouch it. And then what I'm going to want to do is not have to sharpen it, but hone it. Just kind of polish it a little bit to get that edge back. And it goes right back to cutting like it had been doing where I don't have to constantly keep resharpening it. And a razor sharp knife that you're using, you're doing a lot of sharpening because that thin little razor sharp edge dulls quickly. And then you got to take off a lot of meat to get it back to that razor sharp edge. See, kind of like a, you know, a hot rod performance car, man, it goes from zero to 60 like that, but it uses a lot of gas doing that, doesn't it? There's a lot of RPMs. There's a lot of maintenance on that thing, but man, it goes zero to 60 like that. Yeah. But a truck over here with a quarter of its RPMs, it gets to 60 in 20 seconds, you know, a nice leisurely. And that thing has a life expectancy eight or 10 times the engine over that high performance because of the maintenance, the stress, the strain. Same thing with knife blades. If it's thin and it's polished and it's tight, and man, it's just great for show, great for precision. If I got to do surgery, absolutely. But on the other hand, for general purpose, it's really a lot of maintenance. I'd rather just have a good robust edge. K-Bar, you know, Tony Wilson K-Bar, I used a K-Bar for a lot of years. That My first really good field knife was a military issue K-Bar that was given to me by my uncle. And it had the old uh, Mark II Navy sheath, that fiberglass-like green sheath with the metal frog on top. That was my very first really good field knife. And uh, I did a video on the K-Bar. Uh, talking about it, etc. And for bushcraft, I've modified the tip to get it more in line. That up hook tip, great for fighting, not so great for skinning and cleaning and doing field work. And so I mod would modify the tip on one. But like the base of the K bar, like I said, he turned the base, that flat base thing, into a compass, into a clock. And um, he took the cross guard, the knife guard, and he put a little notch in it. So he could sit it up to his eye, the butt of it up against his cheek and look at it and use the edge of the knife like a siding and use it for range. And he had marks in it where he could call in artillery. If he could see it out to like three or four, five hundred yards, he could use them marks and he knew how far it was for range finder to call in artillery. So he had a lot of uses for a K bar. Bush would ever consider doing videos on restoring dens lanterns. Absolutely. Uh, kerosene lanterns, dens lanterns and stuff. I've got quite a bit of experience with them. And uh, we used to make a modification um, to where we could put a. It was about a half inch thick puck with a hole in it. And in the top of the lantern where you got the lift ring we would put a blind rivet with a screw so you could screw into it. And you would sit it up there and screw it down into it right quick, and you could use it and put a coffee pot on top of it and have a kerosene lantern cook off of it. The heat of it was enough. It was slow to heat it up, but if you weren't in a big hurry, once it did get there, it would maintain heat fairly well. And we could keep coffee going or boil water or whatever in a deer blind or whatever, we would take the small little den flanners. It's like half the size of a standard one. And being poor and young, we would go out for a deer stand. We would have like a bucket to sit on up against a big old oak tree. And I would take a blanket and put it back behind my back and sit down and then drape it this way. And then between my feet, you know, between like, here's your legs, here's the bucket, that gap underneath your legs, got a space about that big, I would put one of those small dens lanterns and light it and put it about 
low, you know, where you had a, enough normal light, you know, and then wrapped the blanket all the way around. So just my head was sticking out and it would trap the heat. And so it'd be 18, 19 degrees out here in this swamp bottom, cold as all get out and would trap the heat and keep me warm while we're sitting on that stand waiting for deer. Um, and then, of course, if a deer or something came up, you just stood up and dropped the blanket out of the way and took your shot. But uh, that little bitty lantern, you use one a lot uh, for camping and all kinds of stuff. They make a very good addition to your camping gear. Leslie, how do you feel about bush knife sharpness? Like I was talking about, I feel that the uh, a good working edge of something that will just shave, okay? When you go to shave off your arm, I mean that if you just lightly go, it doesn't shave, but if you kind of bear down a little, it will shave. Is about as sharp as I want to go in a bush knife. That edge will typically hold up because when I'm bearing down into wood trying to carve off or whatever and, and to carve seven notches or make feather sticks or whatever and wood is like any other living thing it's got some gnarly grain in it or whatever i do not want a very thin edge because it can get wavy in there uh, you know I've, I've seen some really nice sharp knives and you go to try to make a feather stick and it's just gnarly grain and they're like ah. and you can get it burning good light and you see the edge start doing this because of the torque of it so i like a more more robust edge not nearly as steep an angle bush bunny don't worry it's just a skill you can learn leslie how sharp do i keep a machete at the base close to my hand about that first two inches as sharp as i can get it i want that to be like the knife edge because that's where I'm going to come up here and do this up really, really close, you know, about from that three inches from my hand up. I want it on a scale of one to 10, about a six. And then from there to the tip, it goes down. I want it about like a four because that front third is my really more blunt edge. That's the hard hit. That's when you got that, that, limb or whatever you got to rear back and put the power to it where speed and design is not going to go through it you need brute force and the very tip of the machete right there at the, that last inch is blunt because that's when i'm hitting on the ground usually that's when you're busting a root or whatever to get it out of the way that's your grubbing edge so coming from the very tip going back toward the grip the very tip is dull because that's dirt Hitting, break it, bust it, okay? That first, say, two, two and a half inches past that is kind of like an axe edge. It's just an edge. It, it, you reach up there, it's got some edge you would have to bear down to cut yourself. From there back to that, you know, that really sharp edge, that long section right there is sharp enough. It will cut with very little pressure. And then that last say two inches, two to three inches right there at the grip. That's as sharp as I can get it because that's when I do need a true sharp because you're never going to chop nothing with it back there. But that's where I need to whatever cut something up to that vine or whatever that's just so elastic. Every time you hit it, it don't seem to want to go through it. That's where I can and make it go through. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I run a machete. Leslie, what is, survival food is your go-to? Woo! Believe it or not, what I carry more than anything else is instant mashed potatoes. Uh, that or rice. Because I can add wild stuff with that. Rice especially is really good. I can add spices to it. It's a good carb. It doesn't weigh much. It, all it needs is hot water. You can bake it, you can stir fry it, you can whatever. And so for if I'm going to be carrying one food group, it'll be rice. Because from that, I can add anything I can pull off the environment to make a better meal for me. But if it's all I got, it will keep me going. It ain't my favorite, but it works good. <coughs> now, powdered instant potatoes work good as well because they go with just about everything.
Hello, Andrew. What's your opinion about small breakdown survival guns or rifles? If they're going into a kit or something like that, um, yeah, very good. You know, especially something that's going to be stored in a, uh, a cabin, stored in a vehicle or something like that, where I don't, as a daily rule, carry anything else. But I might end up in a situation where I might need such a survival thing, a bush pilot, a boat set or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. The take aparts are a good way to go because it is usable and it's functional. And yet you've got better. See, it would never be my first choice to go hunting with, but it would be adequate, you know. But at the same time, it keeps me from locking down really one of my preferred hunting guns into this kit. You know, the advantage of the takedown, you know, like the uh, the M7 uh, survival rifle. It's a 22 semi-automatic that takes down and goes into the butt stock. It floats and everything. Great on a boat. Great in aircraft. Great stow behind the seat in a truck or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And a 22 long rifle, if you had, you know, like someone uh, who's an animal lover, they're not a hunter. And I fully respect that. Um, they said, but they had come across a wreck where someone had hit a cow. And the car of the individual is severely damaged. They're hurt, but not going to die. She, she then dialed 911. But the cow is suffering. It broke its legs. It's in a lot of pain. And she wanted to end its suffering. And she didn't have anything. And so we got one of those survival rifles. You know, and I taught her how to use it. I said, out of compassion, when you have to do this, this up close will drop anything, you know, especially in that kind of situation. I would not want to pick it to be the thing go hunting cows with. But at the same time, if it was something like that, where it's a dog or it's an animal and you're just wanting to end its suffering, pop and it would be over. And so for their use of a survival bug out, et cetera, it worked very well. And I think that those type of guns are very good and can be. Durability is not high. Remember, this is meant to be a survival rifle, not a rest of the universe rifle. And so like those ARs and things, they normally do really good. But once you get five, six thousand, ten thousand rounds through it, those receivers and all don't hold up well. And they get where they're real sloppy and they jam a lot. And I've known guys that have had them new, used them, whatever, since the 70s when those guns started to come out. Many manufacturers have made those guns. And so like the take apart guns I talked about, the double barrels that are over under, very usable. Um, it's just whatever you're going to be using, you know, what you're comfortable with. Cool. Uh, Bush says, uh, I was watching your old ways video on lighting and inspired me to restore my grandpa's old den's comment lantern. Absolutely get them out and clean them up. Um, power outages or whatever, they are invaluable. Uh, and learn how they work. Learn their advantages. Learn their disadvantages. You know. But uh, they are, when you can't get no electricity, they are a way to uh, do several things. And being down here in Hurricane Alley, you know, we have several because they're great in that time period. We've got flashlights and you got those lanterns. And I can cook off of a lantern. I can't cook off of a flashlight. So... Edgar, I want to be able to shoot a thousand yards with a cheap deer rifle and a hundred dollar three by nine. That's my goal for me. You've got a good challenge there. Can it be done? Absolutely. But it's going to be a challenge. Nothing is impossible given enough time and resources. You know, bottom line, the, the national champion at a thousand yards um, in the civilian uh competition in the United States for like four or five years and he was the, the national champion every one of those years was using a $25 Lee hand loader to load the ammunition 
the day of the match on the range. Hell was loaded his ammunition right before the match. And all these big names that were just aghast, but you cannot create quality ammunition for anything less than $5,000 investment and, and this and this and this. And he was making it out of a $20 Lee hand loader. You know, nothing is impossible given enough time and resources if you take the time to learn. So go for it. Yeah, uh, Leslie, about the, the taters. We do something called camp taters. And what it is, you get the uh, brown gravy powdered mix. Practice at home. Take and figure out which brand of the instant potatoes you like. And add a little bit of the powdered gravy mix to that's dry to the dry potatoes. And package it up yourself. We call those camp taters. And so I just dump it into a canteen cup, add the water, and I forget the exact ratio, but I want to say it was uh, one cup of dry, one or, or a half a cup, might be a half a cup of uh, dry mashed potatoes to one tablespoon of the powdered brown gravy mix mixed together. And I add in salt, pepper, and et cetera. And then I'd seal that up in a sealer meal. And then when I'd get out there, all I got to do is tear it open, dump it in the, into boiling water and start stirring, you know, and uh, instant camp taters. It's really good. Hello, Tom Ritter. How you doing, sir? Hello, uh, Bear. Glad to see you, sir. Warden, there's no such thing as rookie camping. There's camping. Uh, everybody has to start somewhere. I don't care who you are and how lofty or accredited or whatever. I started out with dang near nothing. Um, I think my first camp out, I had a pillowcase to carry my gear, and I was carrying it over my shoulder tied to a walking stick a la hobo style. I think a shower curtain was my first tarp. Uh, and then I got a uh, got a poncho, military poncho not long after that. So, yeah, there's no such thing as rookie camping. They're just learning. Get out there and try it. You'll be amazed what you learn from the crappy gear will apply to the good gear. And you kind of miss out if you just go straight to the good gear. Um, having a tarp that you just touched and it goes to leaking. You learn how to make sure that sucker's good and tight and you ain't touching nothing during a rainstorm. Um, and you learn how to pack leaves around the edge so the wind don't blow rain underneath the edge. And although you're under a tarp, you're getting wet because it's sprinkles coming under the side and things like that. You learn and uh, you pay your dirt time. You screw up. You get dirty. You laugh it off. Okay, I learned something. Failure. You know, fail. First attempt in learning. I stand upon a mountain of screw-ups, guys. That's where I learned this stuff. I took the time, got out there, and I went, okay, why didn't that work? You know, and I didn't have a lot of money, so you had to improvise. And a lot of the guys that I know, I respect, that's how they come up, too. Tiny Titan, I don't think you're the only woman in here, uh, Tiny Titan. I think there's some others mixed in here. A lot of them are just being quiet. Um, in fact, I was at uh, my local shooting range here recently, and uh, they were doing a woman seminar for uh, shooting. And we have a thing down here in Alabama for many years, and I don't know if I haven't heard of it in several years, but it was called the Woods Woman. And what it is is they got individuals that had experience in camping, archery, uh, shooting sports, tactical, all of that, and they would have events, and it was a woman's event for y'all to come out and to get with good instructors and get some hands-on training on how to camp, how to fish, how to do archery, how to do hunting, how to do uh, target shooting, self-defense stuff, how to set up a tent, how to set up a hammock, and things like that. Because as of the last I heard was 2,000, 60% of all new hunters are women nationwide 
sixty percent of the new hunters are women, and so daughters are going to the field to hunt and camp more than the boys are. And so we need our skills and stuff need to reflect that. And I've always been a big advocate for the ladies in the woods. And so of talking to that club out there and saying, look, if you want to do a woods woman thing, count me in. I am more than happy to come out and work with the ladies in any kind of camping, shooting, whatever. I've been an archery instructor, a shooting sports instructor, et cetera, camping instructor. I'll be glad to come do it. So we're probably going to try to put on something after the first year for the ladies getting some sort of event going down there. I'm always encouraging the ladies to get in there and do it. And Pam, Miss Pam is a Pam Comber. She's a lady, tiny Titan. She's tough. She's a good camper too. And she is wicked with a knife. She knows her stuff now. Tim Bell, yeah, first attempt in learning. Fail. Good, you failed. Fail better next time. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? Success teaches you nothing. Failure teaches you everything. It is the greatest teacher of all. Failure. God knows it. First time I was trying to make a flint and steel fire, oh my God. First time I was trying to do a bow drill fire. You'd have thought I was having a heart attack. You know, I was a sawing like a madman, smoke going every which way, and I couldn't get that sucker to ignite for nothing. Wrong kind of wood. I live in an environment that's high humidity, and the humidity was like 90%. Trying to do a bow drill in 90% is just about futility. You'll get a coal, and it'll go, whew, and go right out. The moisture in the air puts it out. And so I'm out there in that heat, sweating like a fool working and working and just running through a board, burning through, I'd get this coal and go like, uh, and go out. And I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. Environment. I took the time to learn. But had I went by that, I would have never gone back to the bow drill. You got to be willing to take the time and realize and laugh at yourself. Okay, I screwed that up. A sense of humor is the best survival skill there is. Don't get all, excuse me, don't get all wound up and, oh, oh this isn't going to work or whatever. We're, we're kind of in society kind of trained to that. You know, we're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of somebody looking at you and going, look at the idiot over there. You know, you know what? Laugh it off. Um, I had somebody that... Uh, they wanted to uh, teach me to shoot shotgun on skeet. And I wasn't very good in the beginning at all. And uh, they made fun of me. And I told them from day one, go ahead, have a good laugh. But understand, I learned. And so after about two and a half months of us every weekend getting together at the club and the group and everybody, and we started doing it. And I started running birds. Where it was, I didn't get one. I got 10. I got 15 that time. I got 20 that time. I made a full run of 30 and never missed. Then I'm busting them further out than anybody else. And he's still laughing at me. He ain't paying attention to what I'm doing. And somebody pointed out, do you realize he's the number one on the leaderboard? Because I learn. Go ahead and laugh. Have a good laugh. I learn. And right now I don't know what I'm doing. So enjoy the laugh. I'll learn. Yeah, uh, Bush up on Vancouver Island, you, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, you have similar environment to what we have in the Southeast. Of course, you get the snow and cold and we get hurricanes, but the high humidity, those storms that just roll in suddenly and the humidity just goes through the roof, same idea. We're getting it off the Gulf. You're getting the jet stream pushing it on to you. But it's the same basic idea. And our forests even look a lot alike. We're, we're a tropical rainforest. It's a jungle. But when you look up there in Oregon at that type of rainforest, it is not that far removed. 
I would probably feel fairly at home up there in your neck of the woods, and you'd probably feel fairly at home down here in mine. John B., you know, percussion revolver fate. Learn not to squeeze the bolt with pliers while trying to adjust timing. You are correct. <laughs> Ain't it amazing how it just goes. It don't give you any warning, does it? it it's the same thing with the spring on the hand. You think, all I'm going to do is, yeah, pow. Yeah, been there, done that, got a drawer full of broke parts. You learn. Correct, Edgar. Practice making a fire with just a big lighter when everything wet seems, etc. I say that in my, my video about building a fire kit, you know. All the primitive methods are great skills to know when you got nothing else. But um, never bet your life on it. And when it's really cold, it's nasty, it's horrible, pull out a big lighter. I mean, you know, pull out the lighter. To heck with that, because if you've got a choice, don't ever you do that stuff, pull out a lighter. Um, my mentor, Francis McGowan, whenever he was uh, teaching me, and I told him I wanted to learn bow drill. I would had a, a little bit of working knowledge, but I really wanted to learn it better. And we are I was going to be spending a week with him at his cabin on his how many thousands of acres down there at uh, Pigeon Creek. And he said, okay, tomorrow when you get down here, we'll start. So for lunchtime, he said, you're going to start the fire for the coffee with a bow drill. So I had to go down in the woods, come up with a, and make a set from scratch. Now I could use the same string and the same bow, but I had to make a spindle and I had to make a fireboard. Okay. Then I had to generate the coal, blow it in, get the fire lit. And that was for the coffee. We're making sandwiches or something like that, right? To make coffee. When I did it and I got the fire going, I took the spindle, I took the fire board, and you throw it in the fire. Do it again tomorrow. And every day at lunch, I built a fire board and a spindle and a top. And I built the fire. And then once I had the fire, I threw the top, the spindle, and the fire board in the fire and burned it. That's what he told me to do. Do it again tomorrow. Now do it again tomorrow. Now do it again tomorrow. Now after seven days, on Sunday, whenever I did that last fire, and I threw it in the fire. And I got up and sat down in the chair, you know, sitting next to him. He said, so, Blackie, tell me what you have learned about the bow drill fire. I said, I'll carry a big lighter in my pocket till I die. And he said, that's what I learned, too. And so I carry a lighter, you know. I, I know how to do the primitive methods, and it's a great skill to have. But when it's nasty and it's wet, and you really do need a fire, Pull out a lighter and get out there and practice in those wet conditions. I tell guys a great thing to do on a rainy day is put your rain set on. Let's see how well it works. Let's go for a hike with our poncho or our range jacket or whatever it is we've got. Let's give it a try. Because right now it doesn't matter. We're just going to the park and going to walk around for an hour in the rain, right? When we've gone on this five or six day trip and we're deep in the middle of nowhere and the rain comes up, that's not the time to find out this rain gear doesn't work that well. Never believe the hype, always verify. That's also the time to get out there in the backyard and practice building fire in the rain. Uh, look around, where's anything dry? Up under that big pile of pine straw? Get everything else ready and then lift up. And there may be some dry underneath because it kind of wicks down slow. So a big pile of leaves, broad leaves, may wick the water off. And so that top two inches may be sopping and wet, but below it may be dry. So don't expose it until you're ready for it. So that's when you go get the sticks and you carve them off and you make the feather sticks and put it up under. The first thing you do is put up your shelter, you know, to get out of the rain. And then you make all your dry stuff and put it somewhere dry. You know, this hat has been turned upside down. I don't know how many times and shade chips of fat wood and stuff into to get a fire going. And then, you know, like I've talked about, if I got fat wood, make a long splinter. 
stick it in the ground or stick it in a stump or whatever, put a big old pile of shavings at the bottom of it, strike it, ignite it, or use a lighter, and it'll ignite it. And it does, that set of the fire and the flame will run up that long splinter and make like 10 or 12 inches of flame coming off the top of it. That's where I take my tender bundle. It's kind of damp. It's all the weeds. I done shook off the, all the water I could. And I hold it in those flames and let it dry it out and get it to burning. And as it starts burning, I lay it down. And then I start putting my dry made up wood onto it and get it going. Once I get a good, once I get two feet of flames, I can handle most rain storms, you know, underneath the canopy. If I'm out in the open, I want four feet of flames to keep the fire from going out. Put big broad stuff up on top to deter the rain so that it's shielding the fire from below. So it's having to burn up and over it. But it's a skill. But it's one of them skills you just got to get out there and get dirty and nasty and everything else to do it. And a great time to do it is those days when you're off and you, it's nasty. And why not? Let's go build a fire. You know, uh, because if it don't work. Oh, well, we'll come back to the house, you know, but you build that skill. You got to put in the dirt time. And that's one of the things where you can read it in a book. And that's a good thing to do. But until you get out there and get in the dirt and you've figured out what works for you, what works for me might not have a really good idea on your side, but find out what works for you in those conditions. That's what you got to do. Yeah, Caveman Television, correct. One of my favorite channels. Colin, do you have any suggestions for a young guy wanting to learn how to hunt but doesn't know anyone close by? Yes. Okay. Um, whatever state you're in, go look at the game wardens. Okay. They may have a different name for them in your state. But typically the game wardens not only have a clinic on hunting that teach you safety and things like that, safety classes and things like that. They'll also tell you how to identify the different species, where to look for them to hunt and et cetera. And almost every state that I'm aware of, and my knowledge, every state does, there are public hunting lands in every state. Now, what the requirements are to get there, I don't know. But like here in Alabama, we got thousands and thousands of public uh, areas to hunt. And even if you're not sure yet, okay, for example, I've got a, a good friend of mine and she has no interest in killing anything, but she recognizes that if times get hard, she may need to. So she wants the skill to do it. So she goes deer hunting and she goes turkey hunting and things, but she doesn't tote a gun. What she's got is a board that's been cut out in the shape of a gun that her phone fits in and when she pulls the trigger it hits the button and takes a picture and she's got a crosshair mounted on it so she's looking at the deer with the crosshair and she takes a picture every bit of that skill is exactly the same camouflage how to uh, track how to hide your scent she's doing every skill except pulling the trigger even to the point of having a crosshair to show where the bullet would have been. Now, she's been shooting. She's a good shot. But she's learning the skill. And I've, I've told people, you know, you can be in Central Park and practice tracking small game. Practice looking to find small game. Listening for birds, and etc. You can be in the biggest city and there's still wildlife around you. You just don't recognize it off the top of your head. It's the same skill set. We're just going to apply it in a different way. See. In fact, I had uh, I mentioned today in a video that uh, I had a young man contact me oh, a few weeks ago, and um, he said, "Can I have a phone number right quick?" And so I said, "Yeah, I send the phone number." And he sent me a video. And he said, "Am I understanding what I'm listening to?" And he said, "Is this a coyote?" And I listened to it. And I went, yes, that's a coyote. That's a mother coyote. And those high-pitched little yips, that's a litter 
uh, that she's got something to eat and she's calling them to come eat. That's what you're listening to. He recorded that in Central Park in New York. In Central Park, in the middle of the city, there was a coyote living with a den. We already know they got coyotes in New York. But in Central Park, he's sitting there at night listening and could hear this yipping and thought, I think that's a coyote. And he contacted me to verify it. So, yeah, even in New York, there was wild game. So this, I would suggest contact the game wardens. They probably got programs that set up just for people like you to learn. The other thing is practice the skills and educate yourself on whatever it is you're going to start with. I recommend small game like squirrels or rabbit. That's how we start down here in the South because it's fairly fast paced, a lot of opportunity. And if you miss or screw up, it's not a, a huge big waste, so to speak. You didn't, you know, accidentally shoot a horse instead of a deer. And so it's a way to learn. And so that's, that's my pointers for finding out things to do. Okay, we're about an hour and 40 minutes. There you go, Wart 9. Uh, uh, that's going to be a thing. Depending on where you're at is how much space you do have available. I know a lot of states you have to have. It depends on your, your herds as well. Um, lotteries to whether or not you can draw a uh, ticket to hunt certain large animals and things like that. In Alabama, we have a lottery for alligator, but we have so much everything else that we don't worry about it. You know, we do have hunting seasons, but things like hog year round, coyote year round. Uh, I think even now, I believe possum, I think is year round now uh, because our game herds have got so large. So whatever state you're in, contact game wards. That's part of their job is to help you find places to to hunt and what you can hunt excuse me and also show you what is legal to utilize in your state for hunting each state's going to be a little bit different by what they allow and so you just got to educate yourself knowledge is the big thing uh, bears channel will be up and running by the end of the month uh, we have uh, talked about it extensively. We've done some test shootings right now. And so apparently what we're going to be doing initially on is we're going to shoot the videos with his equipment. Then I'm going to edit it for him and hand it back to him for him to load. Uh, and initially, we'll probably be doing a little of both of us. So he'll still be doing always for a time on my channel. And then always is going to shift to his channel. And I'll just duplicate all the episodes always that we've done. For him to load onto his channel, and then um, things like he's wanting, to, like he's wanting to do acorn bread. He's already gathering up acorns to do that. We'll do that together on his channel until we get his channel fully running. Uh, his focus is going to be a little different than mine. We we have very similar knowledge capabilities, but it's in different fields, and he is much more versed than I am in a lot of the homesteading stuff like the cooking and the canning and the preserving. I have a working knowledge. He's got a, a much more in-depth knowledge of it. And so I'll be learning from him, you know, and also reminding me some stuff that I may have seen 45 years ago that I don't remember much of. I remember we did it. I remember how we did it, but I, the hands on. And so by working with him, I'll get some more training. That's some stuff I need to bring back for myself. And so as Bear's channel gets going, it'll be me and him and then him doing his own videos. He'll be on my channel still doing stuff with me and me doing my own videos. So that's the idea. There's going to be a parallel running there for a little bit. By end of the month, he, he promises that by December 1, he will have a channel up. So we're holding him to it. Edgar want hogs. Hogs are very destructive, dude. Yes, they're a fantastic food source. But I'm here to tell you, they will destroy a farmer's field where he goes out and runs a planter. 
and runs from one side of the field planting seeds and they'll come through and in one night just go along eating them seeds just rooting to the next seed uh, the amount of damage them thing does and, and one of the things i tell because you know, i'm right here at a military base and i get a lot of gis are saying you know i'm only going to be here for four months or three months or whatever and i'd love to hog hunt but i don't know where to go or whatever i said go anywhere that farmers hang out so the farmers co-op the seed store, things like that. Any place farmers hang out and put you up wherever they got those bulletin boards or whatever, put you up a little bitty three by five index card saying, if you've got a problem hog, call me. I'll come get it for you. And you'd be amazed how many farmers will call you because he's got a job doing. He ain't got time to hunt these hogs and they're detrimental to his place. So if he sees one, he's going to pop it. But he's not going to waste half a day sitting in the field looking for hog. But he'll call you up and let you come hunt for free, and then you can have the hog. See, I've got a lot of GIs hooked up with a lot of farmers that way to thin down hog populations, and they're tickled to death because they're taking four and five hundred pound hog, which sounds great. Trust me, after you've cleaned a three or four hundred pound hog, then fifty pounders start looking really, really good. They're tender, they're young, and. Uh, that little bitty one right there, boy, that's about that perfect barbecue size right there. You know, I don't need that 500 pounder. Yeah, I've shot a couple of them big boys. Yeah. So hopefully that will be the uh, thing. Yeah, Bill, uh, Bill Whitlock, acorn bread. Yeah, he's going to be showing that. He's made it in the past. I've eaten acorn bread. It's good. It's just labor intensive man but for most of human history we ate acorn bread most of the bread that we or something like we would call bread grain type baked has been acorns or something like that with nuts uh it's only been in the last say eight thousand years or so we've got using wheat or something like that it was always acorns and you can see that throughout Europe and everywhere else in the Americas, wherever there were populations of people, there's acorns, which are one of the most prevalent trees there is, but you'll see it. And um, there was some archaeology I remember reading about that was somewhere in the UK and it didn't make sense to them. And they thought it was some sort of uh, uh, nature religion or whatever, because they'd find villages and the villages were shaped kind of like a horseshoe. And in the middle of it, uh, the open end of the horseshoe would be water, usually. And then there wouldn't be anything built in there. And it would just be overgrown. And so it, they thought it was some sort of religious or whatever. Until they got somebody like me that thinks a little outside the box to looking at it and said, okay, what do you have got in there? And they realized that all the trees and plants inside that horseshoe were edible or medicinal. So it's an uncultivated garden is what you're looking at. You and I would look at it and think it's just an overgrown field. They had hand brought in all of those plants and planted them there. So they had the wild edibles, the wild greens, the medicinal plants and all growing like in the middle of their village. What we think like the square or the center of the town where it could be harvested, taken care of, watered whatever but it wasn't cultivated it was wild plants they just brought in and stuck in the dirt and let it grow wild but it was only when they figured out that every tree in here is medicinal or food bearing every plant in here that we found of any quantity is some sort of bears nuts or you can eat the leaves or it makes really good cordage or whatever and so then they realized oh this was their resources see and acorns was a big part of that because acorns are husked out of the white acorn family. Then they're put into some sort of sack after they've been removed from the shell, put into running water for a week, two weeks, depending, and allow it to leach that tannin out of it, that bitterness out of it, or in modern times, just boil it. And uh, once you've got changing water, you've boiled it several times and got rid of that, the meal that you got left, you're then going to dehydrate that, and that becomes flour to turn around and use like regular old wheat flour and make bread out of it. And it, it's got a unique flavor. It's really good. I like it.
Uh, Ron, yes, I have a bamboo fire saw. I have. To be honest with you, I've had better luck with a bamboo fire saw than I did with a uh, fire plow. I tried that several times and had some success. But if I'm going to do that, it's going to be the winter. Because that's when our humidity drops down low enough down here, like I was talking about. You can get an ember to catch and not be such a pain. Um, but the, taking the piece of... Uh, David West of the David West channel. You want to learn about primitive fire? That's the guy. He does. I didn't believe you could make a fire ember out of a lot of things he's using. So, you know, David West of the David West channel on YouTube. If you want to learn primitive fire, of just about any kind you can think of, he's the guy to watch. Uh, he is really, he's not, an, he's not a bushcraft person. He's just primitive fire is his hobby. And so he does all of his stuff uh, on the, the channel of doing fire plow and doing, you know, bamboo, you know, fire saw and et cetera. And I have quite a bit of bamboo down here in my swamps. And I got to practicing with it a little bit, but I have found bigger diameter is better than the small stuff. And so at least that size and diameter is what I'd get in split to make the, the part to saw on. And like you see in the video, like he does, I would wedge it up against something. I'm going to be standing and bear down and saw back and forth with a couple little sticks on the inside. You're using it. So it's cup up split bamboo and you put a little notch and you start sawing and your coal builds up inside of there. And I got a couple little splinters to hold it in place and bear down, bear down, just keep going and, and it'll blacken up just like a fireboard will. You'll get hot dust in there. You get smoke coming out of it, etc. But of course, they in Asia use the shaved bamboo as a tender. I'm not. I'm gonna use some other tender um, to catch the coal and use it to to blow it into flame. I'm not gonna use bamboo. I've got tons of resources. I'm just gonna use the bamboo to be the fireboard and the ignition part. Well, guys, that's an hour and fifty one minutes. I think we're gonna. Call it quits. Thank you very much for watching tonight. Thank you very much for all your comments. I will go back and read every bit of them. Uh, and thank you very much. I'll try to do it again same time next week. So if you got some sort of question that pops in your head during the week or whatever, write it down. And I'll do my best to answer it. So for uh, uh, all the support and everything, thank you guys very, very much. You're the reason I do this. You know, it's it's really because I want to share the knowledge and it's to answer your questions. It's to be there so that you can ask me directly. And if there's anything I can do, please ask. I'll do my best. Thank you all very, very much. Good night, Miss Pam and uh, Trapper Dan, if you're still there and etc. Tom Ritter, all my buddies. Thanks, guys. Till next time. Safe journeys.